Well, in my last appearance in Minneapolis, I was threatened. Um, we had somebody who just grabbed my phone out of my hand after screaming and yelling at me. And then when somebody went to retrieve it, they beat up on him and he ended up in the emergency room in the hospital. Oh my God. Um, there, I have been had my talks canceled at universities like at uh, Seattle, at the University Bookstore, uh, universities in upstate New York, uh, even at peace churches um, because of threats coming from people who don't want to hear this opinion. Uh, these are people who say they support the struggle for sovereignty and democracy in Ukraine, uh, which I do as well, uh, but they certainly don't want free speech here in the United States. So I think it's important for your viewers to understand uh, that this message uh, is hard to get out. Um, it's been hard to get out in the mainstream media. We have had to take out ads, uh, pay for ads in the New York Times, in the Hill. Uh, we're taking out ads in religious papers right now, like the National Catholic Reporter and Sojourners, uh, because we've written so many op-eds and those op-eds don't get published. So I think there is a form of censorship and there's a uh, a reactionary group out there um, that uh, somehow think uh, that calling for peace talks is it, it shouldn't be allowed. And even uh, members of the Progressive Caucus, uh, I don't know if I should name names, but in one place where uh, I was having an event and we went to visit this member afterwards and we asked to take a picture with her. We had a sign that all it said was negotiations. It didn't even have the word Ukraine in it. And she looked down at it and said, oh, my God, maybe you really want to get me in trouble, don't you? So there's a real disconnect between what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, the needs for peace talks, what's happening in the global uh, community, especially in the global south. Uh, and the lack of an opening for real discussions uh, among members of our Congress and of course, members of the White House. Now, I would say that there also is a big, they're much more clear about what's going on. Uh, they recognize that this counter offensive in Ukraine is not uh, making progress that's gonna change things on the ground. They recognize there's a stalemate. They recognize it's a war of attrition. Uh, and yet you don't hear this from people who are uh, constantly handing over blank checks for continuing the war and you don't hear it from uh, the Biden administration itself. So I should explain to listeners that if you hear uh, overhead speakers in the background, it's because Midia is calling in from the airport because she's just returning from travels, including to Ukraine. So perhaps with that perspective, you can give us a sense of what's going on on the ground and the messages that we're not hearing about the status of the conflict here in the U.S. Well, certainly being in Ukraine, people are uh, very much, um, and for good reason, uh, hating the invaders, the Russians, uh, feeling like um, they want to recover every inch of territory back. Uh, they don't want to talk about negotiations. They want to talk about more weapons and winning the war. And I totally understand that. I mean, there were uh, funerals going on every single day. Uh, there are rows and rows of fresh uh, graves uh, in, inside every major city. Um, this is horrific, and it's understandable the position of most Ukrainians. So I also want to say that those who advocate for peace talks um, have been incredibly repressed, and uh, there is no room inside Ukraine for openly discussing options other than victory. Uh, and yet we are not in Ukraine, we are in the United States. And we understand uh, that um, to stop the slaughter in Ukraine, uh, it, it really needs to be a focus on negotiations because the Russians are not gonna stop. Um, this war is not going to end on the battlefield uh, unless it moves into a more extensive war or into a nuclear war. And those of us who want to see an end to the slaughter in Ukraine, I think, have to step back and look and say, you know, where is this going? And when we see that it's only going uh, to become worse and worse for the Ukrainian people and perhaps for people all over Europe, um, that we have to figure out how are we going to push both sides to the negotiating table? I think that the Chinese have done a really uh, good job in trying to push that since they have leverage with both Russia and with Ukraine. Uh, 
Uh, I think the Pope is uh, pushing hard. We see six leaders from African nations recently traveling to both Ukraine and to Russia. And yet what people tell me as I travel around all over Europe and including Eastern Europe is that this isn't going to end until uh, Biden says that it's time for negotiations, mm. uh, that the Chinese can really put pressure on Putin, uh, as can others. Uh, but until the U.S. administration says, OK, uh, it's time to uh, start uh, the negotiations, that it's not uh, that this war is going to keep going. And that's why we get back to the issue, Brianna, in terms of how can we build up this movement? We've got this coalition called Peace in Ukraine. Um, you could see it on the website, peaceinukraine.org. It's about 100 different organizations. Uh, we meet every month. We have uh, groups that work on the media, that work on uh, contacting our members of Congress, that work on outreach. Uh, and it's exciting that this is a growing coalition. Uh, and that's one way that people can get involved if they want to, because really the responsibility is on us. We are uh, the people living in the country that is uh, paying for the war, uh, that has um, not promoted, in fact, done just the opposite, has stymied negotiations in the past. And so we have a big responsibility. We know what the mainstream response is to the question of negotiations or a ceasefire or anything that seems to be inching us closer to peace in Ukraine. It is that to have a ceasefire right now is to concretize uh, the territorial expansion of Russia that was done in violation of international law and validating Russia in some way, and that is unacceptable, and it should not be America's role to bargain away Ukrainian territory, et cetera. So I want, I want to know how you respond to people who frame what we consider to be movement in the direction of peace as bending the knee to uh, an un illegal effort by Russia, which of course we don't endorse, but how do you untangle untangle that for folks who are inclined to say, n n there's, there's no ethical way to go here other than to go back to the, the lines that existed in January of 2022? I think we have to ask, well, what is the alternative? Where is this going? Uh, where is it leading? In fact, we heard about six months ago when uh, General Milley, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that Ukraine was in a good position and should immediately seize the moment for negotiations. Mm. As this war goes on, Ukraine is actually in a worse and worse position uh, because Russia has more soldiers, they have more weapons, they have a war economy. You know, the U.S. and its Western allies, we hear that all these weapons are going in, but it's a hodgepodge of all different things. And it doesn't make for a well-trained, well-equipped military. And so things will only get worse. And of course, there is the a nuclear card. And we can hate the fact that uh, Putin has access to nuclear weapons, but he does. Um, we can uh, hate the fact that uh, that the <clears throat> invasion ever, ever started, but it did. Uh, and so really the question I ask other people is, where is your scenario taking us uh, if Ukraine is only going to be in a worse and worse position? And I think this idea that Ukraine can win um, is something that really is outside of reality, especially if you talk about um, being able to take back every inch, including Crimea. Uh, the Russians are just not going to allow that to happen. And I think people have to understand this is not just Putin, uh, that there are a lot of people in Russia who are criticizing Putin for not doing more, for not going harder, for not really prosecuting this war. I mean, I was if you're in the, the capital of uh of Kiev, or if you're in a place like Lviv, uh, you hardly know there's a war going on. Mm -hmm. There is, unfortunately, a heck of a lot more that Russia could be doing to make life really miserable uh, for so many more Ukrainians. And uh, just like there are people that are faulting Biden for saying, uh, you're not going whole hog into this, you're not sending all the weapons you need, uh, they need, you're not, you're, you're going slowly and just crossing each line with a lot of pressure. Um, the same is happening in Russia. 
So I think this should scare the heck out of everybody. Where is this going? Where is it leading? And anybody with a sense of rationality should say, stop, we must find a way to stop this. I mean, why are people all over the world uh, calling for an end to this? It's not because they love Russia, they love Putin, they think that Russia's doing the right thing. Uh, it's because this is affecting the entire world. It's affecting millions of people's access to uh, food at uh, prices they can afford. It's affecting energy. It's affecting politics. Um, it's actually allowing for right-wing forces to be building up uh, throughout Europe and possibly even in the United States. So uh, I think there are so many reasons uh, for people to say, uh, this has gone on way too long. If we allow it to keep going, it will only get worse. And to listen to those voices who are the voices of reason, whether it's the Pope or whether it's Lula in Brazil or uh, whether it's the six uh, leaders of African nations, let's listen to them. So, Medea, what do, I mean, you've spoken to the squad members. What do they yes. say? I mean, what, how do they, to the, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I speak to them constantly. We are constantly calling their offices, going to meet with them, going to uh, events where they are. And, you know, we're trying to do it nicely. And there are others who will get up and. So, but when you, when you say they're not responding, you, you say what you just said to us. They are not stupid. They obviously on some level know this and have internalized it because they signed their names to the CPC letter at some point, which basically just says that and then retracted it. But so like, wh like what is the rationale that comes out of their mouth back to you about why they aren't more outspoken about this issue and why they will de they have completely declined to, de to depart from Biden's line on this at all? Well, some of them say to us, uh, we are going to do something, and then they never do. Uh, some of them say the problem with signing that letter was only one of timing, but that the content of the letter was right. And we say, all right, we'll put out another letter. And they say, oh, no, we got burned so badly on this. Um, this is a key national security issue, and uh, we're not privy to all the information. We're not on the foreign affairs committees. We have to... Uh, listen to what the people who uh, have access to more information are saying. I mean, they have all kinds of excuses. Uh, the biggest one, Brianna, they say is that we're going to do something and then they don't. So we keep waiting and waiting and pressuring and pressuring. And we tell them, you know, this is going to come back to bite you because you have the people on the right who are understanding that this is a politically uh, unpopular issue and they're taking it up. Uh, we have people like Matt Gates, you know, uh, who is uh, leading on efforts around this. And that is not somebody that I want to follow. Neither is Lauren Bobart. Neither is Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't want to follow them. Uh, and I want to follow uh, the people who are people like members of the squad, uh, people like Pramila Jayapal, who originally started that letter. And uh, I think it's getting more and more uncomfortable for them. We keep thinking there's got to be a break. You know, there was a break and that was Rokana. And Rokana, when he came out on CNN after that letter was retracted, mm -hmm. said, well, of course, that makes sense. Of course, we should have negotiations. And he got positive feedback for it. We talked to him and we talked to him regular and he keeps saying that. Uh, but yet he doesn't take any initiative. He doesn't come out with any new letter that we could then use to pressure members of, of Congress on. Um, so it is very frustrating. What we're seeing in the Republican Party is that while it was on the extreme right, there are now efforts for people more uh, in the conservative part of the Republican Party, not the extreme right. People like Mike Lee, congressman, who a, a senator who in the past has worked with Bernie Sanders on foreign policy issues. You know, they came together um, and brought a left right coalition together on the war in Yemen and the War Powers Act. And so we were saying to them now, well, why don't we do the same thing? And Mike Lee with other members uh, like Rand Paul uh, did come out with a letter to Biden on this issue, but he couldn't get Bernie Sanders. He couldn't get any of the Democrats to join in with this. So it's a real dilemma for us. And I think it is that they're getting so much pressure from uh, the leadership in the party. They're getting so much pressure on the White House. Don't show us divided on this issue. Uh, we're already heading towards the election season. We don't want to be seen as a party that can't get it together when it comes to national security issues. This is such a key issue for national security. Uh, don't blow it by 
showing these internal divisions. Media, so many people, are, I mean, I can, I can hear members of the audience thinking, I don't even care about the letter of it all any, anymore. Like even if they, if you, even if you were able to successfully get some letters written to Biden, at this point, it seems like such an anemic response to a huge problem. Okay, like we're we're at the we're at the stage of conversation where it's just just trying to launch a letter, and that is too big a lift for our so-called progressive flank. I mean, it makes me think, what can be done, especially because you have all of these political candidates now posturing as folks who can make a real change. You mentioned Donald Trump. I would argue that a significant part of his appeal back in 2016 was positioning himself as a president who did not want to expand American empire, positioning himself as a quote unquote isolationist. That was very appealing to a lot of folks. Now, did he get into office and uh, do a full frontal attack on the military industrial complex? No. And that raises questions about what people can do or what they're willing to do in the mismatch between rhetoric and intent and in action. And and so when you're looking at now going forward to a can a, a candidate like RFK Jr., I think so many people are attracted to his very frankly, left framing of these issues germane to the war in Ukraine. There is some inconsistency there in terms of his rationale, his logic when he's talking about other parts of the world, most most pointedly Israel-Palestine. Um, but, you know, people like what he's saying about Ukraine. But I had this question for him when we interviewed him on Rising last week, which was, okay, you have... You've said that you support Medicare for all in theory, but you think it's a, a it's too big a lift that it is realistically not going to happen anytime soon. So you don't want to put a lot all of your political energy behind it. You've also said that your own family members have been killed pr- for doing what you precisely say that you want to do right now, which is to end wars, reign in American militarism. What's the harder lift? Why do you think it is that you're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z, but not Medicare for all? And is this just rhetoric that you've, and the real reason, reason you've chosen to be so forceful on the anti-war stuff is not because you think it's any more likely that you're going to be able to affect the Pentagon budget than you are going to be able to bring a universal health care to the United States of America, but because you know there's more political energy behind the anti-war movement right now than there is behind the movement for universal health care. I mean, what should we expect? What should we be looking for from these candidates? Um, what kind of commitments that they should they be making that would help someone like me feel more confident that they mean what they say? Well, I think it's funny that you say that there's more energy behind the anti-war movement because we can't even get you know, five or 10,000 people out on the street in an anti-war demonstration. Well, uh, the which same is, is true. You, you can hardly, and people, you know, made fun of the Medicare for All movement because of this, but we could, hundreds of people, are you kidding me? There were dozens of people out at the, out at the Medicare for All rally back in 2001. And that was right on the heels of Bernie's campaign. So, I mean, I think that's a movement issue. I mean, that's a or- organization issue. But not necessarily. I mean, you you don't feel. Let me ask you this: You don't you don't feel as though um, kind of anti-war in Ukraine sentiment is a real driving force right now in politics, a real galvanizing force. Uh, I think it is uh, becoming one, mm-hmm. uh, but it's been over. You know, it's been eighteen months to get to this point. I also think it's important to understand that this is not like the Iraq war where the U.S. was the aggressor and it was very clear to people. You know, it is Russia as the aggressor. Mm -hmm. And so it is not as clear to people. And while I think that sentiment exists generally among the population of saying, wait, this, you know, doesn't make sense. um, It's not it's a it's a group that's hard to mobilize. Um, That's why I say, you know, it's been tough for us. Uh, We are making. Uh, an average of 200 calls a week to Congress, we should be making thousands of them. And what Pramila Jayapal has said to me is that um, your opponents, the ones who want to continue uh, the funding of this war, are out organizing you 10 to 1. Uh, they are in the halls of Congress. Uh, they are con- constantly contacting us. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of money and well, they are, are well they? organized. Um, there are Ukrainian American groups. 
Uh, some of them might actually be getting money from uh, related to uh, U.S. government kinds of things. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.